Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Curtis. I'm a partner with White Jankowski in Denver. Um, if you're wondering, Kevin seems like a pretty nice person. What kind of a terrible, litigious law firm would sue Kevin? It was us. Um, I want to talk about quality issues primarily. Kevin's talked about augmentation plans a little bit. I'll explain that. Just go through the quality issues with produced water. I want to point out the difference real quick between coal bed methane operations and traditional oil and gas operations. Coal bed methane, you're generally dealing with uh, shallower formations. You're dealing with larger quantities of water, greater potential for surface and groundwater impacts and potential impacts in terms of both quantity and quality. The difference between that and conventional oil and gas operations is, as you've heard, uh, they're traditionally targeting deeper, more isolated formations, smaller quantities of water, and in that case, quality rather than quantity tends to be a concern. Before we launch into the quality issues primarily with these operations, I wanted to let you know there is a regulatory framework for this. We're not in the Wild West here, and the oil and gas companies can't do whatever they want. There's federal oversight, state oversight, agency oversight. Uh, the first thing, again, Vance B. Wolf, Kevin talked about that. I just want you to understand that under those augmentation plans, Basically, when they operate a well, they have to replace their depletion to the surface stream. So they pump the well, and over time, that water is going to reduce the flow in the surface stream. There's a requirement under Colorado law that's now imposed on oil and gas wells through bands that they replace quantity and quality, and that becomes very important. Uh, the state engineer has interpreted these requirements to apply to all oil and gas wells, not just coal bed methane wells, and that's why we had the 40,000 wells that were subject to the permitting Kevin was talking about. Colorado law and water quality, this is statutory. Uh, if you're told otherwise by an oil and gas operator, uh, they're not correct. You can look it up. Uh, in an augmentation plan, you have to replace water in time, location, and amount. That means they need the water in April, it has to be replaced in April. If they need it at their head gate, you can't replace it below it so that they're not getting the water they're entitled to. Uh, amount, an acre foot of depletion equals an acre foot of replacement requirement. And quality, if you're an irrigator and they replace that with water, and we'll talk about a specific example of this in a few minutes, they replace that water with water that's not of a suitable quality. That's a violation of Colorado law. Prior to approving an augmentation plan through the water court, the state engineer can also approve substitute water supply plans. They're basically a one-year plan that operates pending that approval. That water quality requirement applies there as well. So there's no circumstance under which they should be allowed to replace water they're depleting that you may have a water right in with water of an inferior quality. General public policy, and I won't read through all this, but basically it's to conserve and protect the quantity and quality of water for various uses, including aquatic life, domestic, agricultural, and all other beneficial and recreational uses. So we have an overarching policy that's applicable to oil and gas as well. I just want to point out that EPA, the federal regulatory agency, uh, has recognized that intense oil and gas development has had uh, impacts uh, to private citizens with oil and gas wells and we've, uh, with water wells. Uh, we've seen that in this area and I'll have specific examples. Again, the problem with the groundwater contamination or depletion is it's almost impossible to fix this. And EPA, again, has said that, that Cleaning up or treating this may be cost prohibitive or impractical. The Clean Water Act, EPA is charged under the Clean Water Act with not allowing discharge of any pollutants into the waters of the U.S. without a permit. 
They also regulate, and unfortunately, this community has seen all of these regulatory schemes in connection with some operations we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they also regulate injection of produced water, generally under a Class II or Class V injection permit. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, um, and I'm going to skip this slide just to move this ahead. EPA, uh, through the Colorado Agency, the Colorado Department of Health and Environment, regulates discharges of produced water under the Clean Water Act. And they have a similar mandate under state law to not discharge pollutants into state waters without a permit. So any discharge of this water by an oil and gas producer into state waters includes a surface or groundwater discharge. In addition, COGCC uh, has several rules, 907 that covers treatment, disposal, reuse and recycling. Uh, 908 provides requirements for waste management and 325 identifies construction requirements for disposal uh, and then identifies formations where that produced water can ultimately be injected. Water quality concerns. So you got that overlay and I'll point out, we just had a decision come down this afternoon in California District Court. In addition, the Bureau of Land Management is no longer allowed to issue permits to oil and gas companies that don't take into account environmental impacts. So that decision was just made today. So BLM is going to be another player in regulating what goes on. The issues we're trying to address with this regulatory framework are, again, contamination of groundwater supplies, discharge of high SAR water, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, sodium adsorption ratio water, which is a ratio of magnesium and calcium that's not good for a variety of uses, and stormwater runoff. Um, stormwater runoff is really self-explanatory. Um, these are photographs from a gentleman named Ken Valentine out of the uh, Pishpaw Basin. And I try to be honest with people, and I'll tell them who's doing what, and if they want to stop doing it, we'll stop taking pictures and showing them to people. This is a Pioneer XTO operation. Um, it's not properly regulated or, or monitored, and what you get are surface discharges during rainfall events, and those end up in the stream and back in the groundwater table. This is an example, again, from the same site. Contaminants. Uh, in addition to the, the SAR, the salt component in some of this water, you have the problem of what comes back up when they do the fracturing. They contain chemicals like benzene, which in very, very small quantities are harmful and cause cancer. Other things we've seen, ethylbenzene, toluene, which is paint thinner, naphthalene, formaldehyde, which is good for dead people but not so good for live people. Uh, ethylene glycol, which you probably have in your radiator, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. This is one of my favorite slides, and you'll note the producer of this was Pioneer and XTO, and they suggested in a presentation at a hazardous waste management conference that essentially what they do is they put in water, 99% water, and then some other things, including um, nitrogen, guar gum, which is used in food products, uh, breakers, surfactants, which are laundry detergent essentially, and miscellaneous. Miscellaneous is the one you should be concerned about. Um, this gentleman went so far as to suggest it's basically things you would find in grandma's spice rack. Uh, he's got a picture of clothes. and So what you should have your wells tested for based on this slide is for raspberries <laughs> and spices, just to be safe. Uh, this is actually what Grandma's Spice Rack looks like out at the sites. Large pallets of chemicals that are being injected. And again, if they're large quantities of water, 1% can still be significant. I would not drink a glass of water that is 1% arsenic. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, SAR is the other issue. This is the proportion of sodium ions in relation to the concentration of calcium and magnesium. And what we know is that high SAR levels create soil problems which prevent plants from effectively absorbing water and nutrients. Also demonstrated uh, adverse impacts to livestock, aquatic, and human life. 
And I just, the, the slide reflects this, but I want you to note the producer of the slide is the American Petroleum Institute. So this is not cutting edge information. It's been known for half a century what this does, and they list the, the following impacts, the ones we just talked about, to aquatic life, irrigation, and livestock. And specifically with soil, this shows you what it does. Uh, the top part of the slide shows normal uh, soil, where you can get nutrients in and out, you can get water in and out, and the plant grows. And when you apply this to soil, what you get is in the bottom slide, which is compacted soil, which is essentially like trying to uh, grow something in cement. So it's not productive, and when they're using this either as a discharge or a replacement supply, it's not suitable. Remember the slides a few back where it says you have to repl provide replacement water that's suitable for the uses that other people are using it for. It doesn't meet this requirement. Uh, so, knowing these things, real quickly talk about disposing of produced water. The first thing is surface discharge. You can inject it, you can evaporate it, you can reuse it. Surface discharges. Simplest one, and in military terms I would call this the dishonorable discharge. It's uh, a pipeline that goes right into the river. This is again Pioneer XTO in the Apishpa. We've seen this done here. Petroglyph Operating Company. You saw slides um, earlier from Mr. Watts about <clears throat> how much water is produced in the Arkansas Basin. When Petroglyph Operating Company was operating in this area, they were producing more water on an annual basis than the entire Arkansas Basin out of their coal bed methane production and discharging it. Uh, in addition to those discharges, uh, you end up with a discharge when the piping and remediation uh, setups for these operations are not properly monitored and maintained. You get leakage, goes into the surface supply, goes into the groundwater. Brett Corsentino is in the audience tonight, and I wish he was not, and I wish this had not happened, but this is what Pioneer and XTO, or I'm sorry, Petroglyph Operating Company, which is Intermountain Industries, and they're trying to come back into this town as 310 LLP. And you need to be aware of what they've done and, and what's likely to happen in the future. They discharge huge quantities of this SAR water into the Cucharis River above where Mr. Corsentino diverts his water supply. His business model was grow corn, feed his cows, milk the cows, sell the milk, feed his family. That business model was destroyed by Petroglyph. This is what his corn crop looked like. You can see the the growth in the middle, instead of 12 feet of corn, he's got four feet of corn. And what the corn looks like up close is this. It looks like somebody irrigated it with salt water, which is essentially what was being done. He had no way of knowing this water was that way until after the fact. And I talked to Brett earlier, and his operations are not right yet. And this is a company that's thinking of coming back and doing the same thing, potentially on a larger scale. The other thing it does, and unfortunately, uh, Brett was a recipient of this benefit as well. You see John Hickenlooper drink a glass of produced water. That's fine. But if you've got a cow that's drinking gallons and gallons, especially a dairy cow, this water, it builds up in their system and it causes tuberculosis. And Brett had to have his entire herd taken away and destroyed and start over. So he's got no cows, he's got no crops, and he's trying to run a dairy farm and they've done nothing to help them. The other thing that we've seen, again, here in this community, is the effects of SAR water on aquatic life. There's a lake up the road from Brett called Maria Lake, one of the oldest storage rights in the state. Trophy fishing that I understand is comparable to what you'd see in Alaska, and Petroglyph discharges water and basically killed their lake. What it did was destroy the aquatic habitat the lake didn't aerate properly. They had to put in an RO system at their own expense, an aeration system at their own expense, and what happened to the fish was, it ate them up. Uh, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but they end up with pinholes in their eyes, they end up with quarter-sized holes in their gills, and the fish die, and they're replaced at a cost of about six to eight hundred dollars a fish, again paid out of the pocket of the people that unknowingly diverted this water. 
This is not my opinion. This is evidenced uh, by the Colorado Department of Health and Environment who recognize that discharging this water has a known detrimental effect to irrigated agriculture. And they went further than that. They referenced Mr. Corsentino's farm by name and said that these discharges since 2006 onto his property ruined a farm that's been in his family for four generations. And it's not just CDPHE, you'll see at the bottom, Colorado State University and the USDA's uh, National Salinity Team also agreed with that finding. Uh, the other thing is when you're discharging this, um, Pioneer and XTL in the Raton Basin, uh, under an augmentation plan, they're, dis they're discharging that non-tributary water that Kevin talked about, and it's poor quality, and they get credit for it as a replacement supply. And the way they get credit for that, because they can't meet their permitting requirement, is they run it in the Apishpa River, they dilute it down, and then they measure it in the, the river. So they're basically using the river for a toilet and then getting credit for that water that doesn't meet the legal requirement we talked about at the beginning in the first place. Uh, similar operation of the Purgatory River. Uh, injection wells, uh, I'm running short on time here, but the, the class five well is what was involved down here. And it was part of a remediation program. And that remediation program came because when they were dewatering the aquifer and pumping the bad water onto to Mr. Corsentino's property, at the same time, they opened up the vertical dikes that we were talking about. They blasted them out, and we had water in a drinking water aquifer that was now flowing down tens of thousands of acre feet into their producing formation, and the gas that should have stayed in the formation was moving up. And I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, this is a picture of what happened. This is from Ben and Melanie Bounds' home outside of town. Um, basically, the gas went into their well, the well pump turned on, and you had yourself a bomb, and you can see a shadow in the corner, which is the destroyed well house. And when I was out there over the summer, they had uh, gas coming out of the ground that you could actually see. And what happened was, uh, they ended up setting up their own system to prevent the electricity from interacting with the gas. You can see in the corner, there's a, a kind of a little home-style uh, fire extinguisher that they set up, uh, hoping that the fire department from here in town would get out there in time to put out any kind of fire they had. The only thing worse than the do-it-yourselfer job they did was to have Petroglyph come in and fix it for you. And they had a well outside of town that was venting gas like a jet engine. And uh, they, they came in and they capped it. They put a PVC pipe that directed it away from the house so it wouldn't interact with the electrical operations. And they vented it over this, a high voltage electrical box. These are not the smartest operators uh, in the country. I'm going to skip ahead here because I'm out of time if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards, but so I've got a whole bunch of other things here. Um, I, I just I want to say a couple of things to you. I know people are concerned about Shell down here and their operations. It's conventional oil and gas, and I would really focus your efforts if Petroglyph comes back in whatever corporate form they come back and having them fix what they've done wrong to this community before they're allowed to do anything else, they need to make that right. And I would focus on them, and I would focus on that above Shell. You need to get your wells tested, you need to make sure they're casing their wells properly, but Petroglyph is, is somebody you need to be watching out for in the future. Thank you.